you don't deserve him just because somebody up there likes you. So one of the greatest mysteries behind favor is what I want to open up because favor affects prayer. It affects what you get and what you don't get from God. If a wife has favor with a husband, there is no need for begging. Most of these ladies that have to beg, argue, they need to be taught something. You don't need that. There are other things you can do then you can avoid the begging. There are master keys to a man's heart. In other words, favor doesn't just happen. There are keys to favor. If something is working, something is making it to work. You know, like the law uh, of inertia, nothing moves until a vital force. You know, they say an object assumes a state of rest or motion until a vital force is applied to alter it. So nothing works until you make it work. Nothing happens for nothing. If somebody is getting answers to prayer, there are certain things he knows. Then write it down. There are certain things God would do for some people that he will not do for others. And yet God is fair. God is not partial. And yet he behaves like this. Can I give you an example? There's a man in the Bible who had a lot of favor with God. A lot of them. And um, uh, the man was a king. His name was David. He messed up a few times. Once he took somebody's wife, got into adultery. You know, and um, killed the husband. The king he took over from Saul messed up too. What did Saul do? He offered a sacrifice. He was not supposed to. That's the job of priest. He just moved from his office to another office. It's like impeachable offenses that sometimes compile against the president. He overruled the rights of the National Assembly. So God was angry. But the reason the gentleman did it was because there was war and he was feeling jittery. The Philistines were coming against him and he waited for Samuel to come and do his job and Samuel delayed seven days. So on the seventh day, out of, um, I won't call it impatience, but out of pressure, he now took the lamb of sacrifice and offered. Few minutes after that, Samuel appeared. It was an offense. Maybe they should call it impeachable offense. And then God decides you are going to be removed. David takes somebody's wife and eliminates the husband. Which one? <laughs> which one? Which of those two offenses? Is heavier. All sins are sin. But the Bible talks about the weightier matters of the law. Bloodshed plus adultery. Anyway, God also comes and says, you're going to die. Problems. For Saul, he will be removed. For you, you will die. Because you killed somebody. But now, what God said concerning Saul happens. But what he said concerning David didn't happen. The man lived till 70, finished his job as a king, handed over to his own son. Today we say political son, or maybe even biological, because they can do it. Handed to his own son. But they don't use election, they use a, a, you know, appointment. How come? The hardest sin, the two hardest sin to atone for in the whole of this Bible is blood guiltiness and idolatry. Most of your families, the kind of generational curse you've been trying to break, if it's related to these two, the kind of demons involved in it are not usually uh, uh, breast-sucking demons. They're not baby demons. 
when blood is shed, they bring the highest level of demonic oppression on the scene. David leaves the throne, leaving a legacy as the greatest king that ruled in Israel till tomorrow. The only person, you know, breaking that record is Christ, who is also one of his descendants. What happened? When Saul was confronted of his wrongdoing, he didn't repent. God sent him on a different, another errand. He said, go and fight the Amalekites. Wipe out the people. It's a holy war because of what they did to the children of Israel when they were coming out. He preserved the king of that nation, brought some animals back. Samuel went to confront him again. See what you have done. You have not obeyed the Lord. He said, I have obeyed the Lord. Notice that many of the things that bring favor on your life are attitudes. In other words, when your heart is right and your hand is wrong, God corrects the wrongness of your hand because of the rightness of your heart. Some people have a good attitude. They have a good motive, but they have not done something right. God, in many cases, is not that he justifies what they've done wrong, but he finds a way to help them out. He said, I've not done anything wrong. The prophet now said, but I hear some animals crying at the back of the house, and I heard that the king of the nation is around. How come you didn't, you brought this one? He said, oh, uh, is it this? No, it's the people that brought the animals. And then, you know, the king, they brought the animals to sacrifice to the Lord your God. There are people like that. I meet them every day. They can never see what is wrong with what they've done. It's a problem called an attitude problem. It's an attitude problem. The right attitude they are missing is the attitude called meekness. Jesus mentioned some B attitude. And he tells us that those eight B attitudes are the keys to favor. They are keys to blessedness. So he will say favored. If you have Amplified Bible, that's how he says favored, blessed, people to be envied are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Favored, blessed, people to be envied are the poor in heart for they shall inherit heaven. One group inherits heaven. One group inherits the earth. What if you have the two attitudes? You will enjoy this earth and you see enjoy heaven. What kind of thing is that? Haven't you seen people who are so blessed here on earth, wealthy, rich, powerful, financially endowed, blessed with long life, blessed with health, and yet they still make heaven like Abraham. Not only that he got to heaven, they are naming streets after him like Abraham's uh, avenue. Lazarus was poor here, but he made heaven. He didn't go to heaven because he was poor on earth. Because a lot of poor people are going to hell. He went to heaven because even though he was poor on earth, he also had poverty of heart. What takes you to heaven is poverty of heart. Not poverty of cash. Did you hear what I just said? Because if not having cash is the road to heaven, then uh -uh, it's very easy oh. I just buy airtime. The whole of next week and tell the whole Nigerians the key. It's not poverty of cash that sends you to heaven. If not, people like Abraham will not be there. People like David will not be there. People like Solomon will not be there. I hope you know Solomon made heaven. Okay, some of you thought he went to hell. <laughs> you know, people like Joseph who controlled the economy of the whole Egypt will not be there. People like Daniel, who was a prime minister, will not be there. People like Esther, who was the queen, will not be there. It's no poverty of cash that sends you to heaven. It's poverty of the heart. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall inherit. And you know, I'm not just talking about entering. When you get to heaven, the big names you'll be hearing. You know, you hear about some kind of names here. You, you talk about United States, you talk about the Rockefellers, you talk about all those big names, Abraham Lincoln's and all the... Now, the, the big names you're going to be hearing about there are the ones who, if you were to meet them on earth, you'll be surprised. 
Why? They don't feel that they're anything. Who is the person that is poor in heart? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in heart or poor in spirit. Notice there are two different things again. I want to separate. It doesn't mean spiritually poor. And it doesn't mean materially poor. These people are needy people. But where? In their hearts. When you meet them, you realize that they are hungry for God. They realize their need for God. Now, uh, 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 that attitude is what produces repentance. Genuine repentance. There are people who sin. It's not a big deal. Even when they apologize. For example, now, have you, have you ever experienced this? You know, you can force a little child because you are the parent to stand up, especially when you bring the kid. Then he stands up, but he's sitting down inside. That's the opposite of being poor in the heart. They don't have genuine repentance. And there are some of them now claiming to be born again and are not born again yet. You see the man, he, something is wrong in his life, but he's aware of it. That awareness of his need, of his weaknesses, of his failures, of how much he has hurt God, how much he has wronged another person, creates what the scripture calls, the word the scripture uses to describe this man is contriteness. Everyone said that word. There is another word the scripture uses. Brokenness. Say the word. Write those two words down. Are you a broken person? You can't find one broken person that is a proud person. You can't find one broken person that is hofty. So it's not even that men have sinned that sends them to hell. Because God has realized that we have failed. And that's why he sent Christ. Is that men will not accept the provision. Psalm 51. You remember that psalm? is the prayer of David after he misbehaved. One person is busy justifying his own wrongdoing. Defending his own wrongdoing. When the prophet will not accept his defense, he shifted the responsibility on the people. It's the people that brought the animal to sacrifice to the Lord. Then he attached sacrifice. As per when you tell him, you, you justify still, like saying, I mean, you know, even though I, I collected the money from my company's account, I plan to give it to the Lord. That you are giving it to the Lord will now cover up the stealing. You know, we robbed last night, but you know, I wanted to sow one of the cars to the men of God. Have you seen how corrupt that heart is? Psalm 51. The other man, see why God pardoned him. And his life, we didn't see the impact of what he did. Psalm 51 verse he starts by saying, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities, cleanse me from my sin. This is why the Bible calls this man a man after God's heart. A man God favored greatly. He is a contrite person. This is a king go. The other person will declare war on the prophet and maybe even order your arrest. This is a king that you are rebuking. But why is it that he receives rebuke? Why is it that he receives correction? Contriteness. Contriteness is why somebody will say, see how what you did to me. Immediately the person will say, please, I'm sorry. I, I didn't really mean it that way. But he even feels bad that he did that thing wrong. He apologizes. You will see. He is sorry. But you have to